The depiction of the enormous, shadowy, capricious and degenerate monster of man is so widespread nowadays that we forget the contradictory history that preceded the rise of that image. We saw the acknowledgments directed at Stalin by illustrious statesmen, diplomats and intellectuals. The pages of his 30 years in government, today simply considered horrific, were in the past read very differently. Nowadays it's commonplace to identify the revolution from above, that radically changed the face of agricultural in the Soviet Union, as an exclusive product of ideological madness. But in 1944, even while revealing its terrible human costs, de Gasperi nevertheless expresses a fundamentally positive judgment on the great economic enterprise of collectivization of the countryside and industrialization, having been made necessary by the danger of war and by the threat revealed in Mein Kampf. 904 nowadays, very few would dare question the thesis according to which the bloody and large-scale repression realized by Stalin had been the exclusive product of his libido dominant or his paranoia. However, between the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s, Malaparte had calmly spoken of the preparations for a coup d'état in Moscow and Stalin's hesitation in counterattacking, Supra, ch. 2, 7. An authoritative German press organization went even further, and mocked the naivety demonstrated by the Kremlin dictator in not sending Trotsky and his crew to the beyond. 905 Around 20 years after the fact, Churchill himself at least indirectly evaluated the trials against Tukhachevsky and the other military leaders, it was a question of a cruel, but perhaps not pointless, military political purge that had eliminated all the pro-German elements, and, to a certain degree, that's true even for the Moscow trials. 906 This stance by the British statesman, champion of the struggle until the end against Hitler as Germany, is yet more significant because it's formulated in a polemic against Chamberlain, the protagonist of the policy of appeasement. More radical or more explicit was the American ambassador to the USSR, Joseph Davis, who continued to insist that there really was a conspiracy, that the trials were carried out according to the law, and that consequently, Soviet authority had been strengthened by it. 907 In 1944, de Gasperi also stressed that the veracity of the charges directed at the anti-Stalin opposition was confirmed by objective American intelligence. 908 Then there was a radical change, but the weakness and the inconsistency of the image of Stalin given to us first by the Cold War and then by the secret report begin to emerge from the research by a growing number of scholars. In some ways one witnesses an evident turnaround. Let's take the Great Terror, alongside the other leading political figures we've already encountered, even a fervent admirer of Trotsky's, namely Dorcha, in 1948 thinks the Moscow trials are more or less credible. In his opinion, Kirov's assassination was in no way staged by the regime. The long tradition in Russia that dared to attack the autocracy with bombs and pistols had returned to influence the young communists. Was not Lenin's brother, by chance, among the conspirators who had tried to kill Alexander III? The textbooks depict those martyrs and those heroes with a romantic halo, that's how the sacred shadows of the past now reappear to arm the more impatient anti-Stalinist comsomils. The ideas of revolutionary terrorism had expanded to the point of constituting a state of mind widespread among the youths and arming the hand of Kirov's assassin. 909 Still in 1949, Deutsche recognized certain psychological truth in the Moscow trials in general, and also a factual truth with regard to the execution of Tukhachevsky in particular. Regarding the latter event, while certain sources speak of a setup by the Nazi intelligence services, numerous anti Stalinist sources argue, however, that the generals had in fact plotted a coup d'etat. 910 In either case, Stalin's paranoia or his libido dominant wouldn't play any role. It must be added that a few years later, 
an American historian unmoved by the revelations of the secret report and who continued to have sympathy for the anti-Stalinist opposition, defined by him as the consciousness of the revolution, wrote, what Bukharin stated in his guilty confession, and what's known from other sources, makes a good part of what was revealed in the trial appear plausible, despite the suspicions provoked by the nature of those trials. 911 Nowadays it's the very scholars of Trotskyist orientation who are calling attention to the civil war unleashed within the Soviet leadership and demanding the opposition's recognition for having promoted by all means the overthrow of the Thermidorian regime imposed by the traitors of the revolution. It's significant that this turn also affects Trotsky's group of followers, who in their time had dedicated themselves, more than anyone else to denouncing the Moscow trials as a pure and simple farce. With regard to the leadership of the USSR, both on the eve and during the Second World War, Deutsch's evolution is particularly tortured and remarkable. We already came across his quite flattering portrait in 1948 of Stalin as a war leader. In 1956, writing in the immediate wake of the secret report, Without much trouble Deutsche believes the revelations according to which in the days following the start of Operation Barbarossa, Stalin had retreated in paralysis to his dacha, unresponsive and angry, only to later, giving in to the demands and pleas from his colleagues, return to lead the country and to conduct a war by drawing fronts and lines attack on a globe. The only criticism Deutsche offers to Khrushchev and his circle is that they hadn't followed the recommendations already put forth by Trotsky in 1927, in other words, of not having understood the duty of toppling Stalin, in order to conduct the war in a more efficient way and guarantee its final victory. 912 10 years later, Returning to this subject, Deutsche writes, I'm not willing to accept the so-called Khrushchev revelations without reservations, particularly his statement that during World War II Stalin had only played a practically insignificant part. 913 It must be said that more recent historical research goes further than this partial and timid reconsideration. Regarding the thesis of the oppressed nations, We've already encountered the radical and positive innovation of affirmative action put into practice in the USSR to the benefit of national minorities, supra, ch. 49, but now it's worthwhile to read the evaluation recently made by another American historian, quote a new consensus is emerging, on the basis that, far from being the killer of nations familiar to Western history and the history of nationalism, the Soviet government takes on an ambitious, complex and prolonged effort to construct ethnically defined nations within a unified state at the political and economic level. With the aim of encouraging this springtime of Soviet nations, the Soviet state conceded juridical and political equality with Russians to the peoples of the former empire. On these new national territories it reserved a privileged place for the languages of the national minorities even when the Soviet ethnographers had to create an alphabet for local dialects, because they had never taken on a written form. That policy of promoting an autonomous national culture went as far as trying to assimilate Russians. Soviet government employees and administrators had to learn the languages of the nations where they worked. 914 Unquote A French historian on Central Asia, Olivier Roy, comes to the same conclusions favorably cited in an essay published in the New York Review of Books, he summarizes the current outlook on that region as follows, they are solid and functional states that can assert themselves if they know how to intelligently take advantage of their Soviet inheritance. The crafters of Moscow's national policy codified languages, built national parliaments, national libraries, and instituted a policy of affirmative action in favor of local cadre. It was primarily and especially Stalin who stood out among the protagonists of this enlightened policy. How far we are from the Cold War thesis formulated by Arendt, according to which Stalin had deliberately disorganized and disarticulated nationalities with the aim of creating conditions favorable for the triumph of totalitarianism. An author 
who was earlier a leader of the anti-Soviet dissidents, states his admiration for the Soviet Union for its national policy in the following emphatic terms, in the decades of Soviet rule, and in its solution to the national question, the positive elements were so numerous that it's difficult to find a comparable example in the history of humanity. 915 Overall the caricature of Stalin made first by Trotsky and later by Khrushchev no longer enjoys much credibility. From the present-day research by eminent scholars, beyond suspect of having indulged in the cult of personality, emerges the portrait of a politician who rises and secures the positions of power in the USSR primarily for the fact that he widely surpasses his competitors when it comes to understanding how the Soviet system operated. 916 A leader of exceptional political talent and enormously gifted. 917 A statesman who saved the Russian nation from annihilation and enslavement, thanks not only to his astute military strategy, but also his masterful wartime speeches, speeches that are at times authentically brilliant, that in tragic or decisive moments managed to encourage national resistance. 918 A figure who doesn't lack qualities when it comes to theory, as demonstrated by the insight with which he dealt with the national question in his writings from 1913, and the positive effect of his contribution to the linguistic question, among others. 919 Certainly, they rightly stress at the same time that this recognition is not an absolute moral judgment, however, the secret report's complete lack of credibility is by now clear. There's not a detail in it that's not contested today. Take the report of Stalin's supposed psychological collapse in the days immediately following the start of Operation Barbarossa, according to the analysis we've already seen from two Russian historians, it's an episode that is totally invented, supra, ch, 1, 2, and that a French historian insists, is in complete contradiction with the testimony and documentation that increasingly comes to light. 920 But it's not a question of a single episode, however significant it may be. Also with regard to the so-called doctor's plot, Khrushchev crudely and deliberately distorted the truth. 921 Yes, he took great liberty with the truth. 922 This observation made regarding Stalin's wartime leadership is generally useful, to get to the truth, it's necessary to look beyond the Western polemics of the Cold War, as well as the circumstances of de-Stalinization in the USSR. 923 